welcome and thank you for joining us for this Tech Talk. It's a very timely Tech Talk. Ironically, we started scheduling it a couple of weeks ago before you know, we heard news of you know, new problems in um, Georgia and um, Ossetia. And I asked Grigori to address it today because I assumed a lot of you guys are here because you're interested in what's going on right now. But I just wanted to go ahead and introduce our speaker. It's uh, Grigori Shvedov, uh, worked um, for over 10 years on the board of Russian human rights, um, NGO, and uh, memorial, uh, dealing with many offline and online projects. He, uh, with that experience, he started a nonprofit um, internet, uh, um, I guess, portal called Caucasian Knot that deals uh, with problems in the regions of Caucasus of former Soviet Union. And it currently covers 19 re regions on 24 by 7 basis. Uh, Gregory um, is here on a Stanford fellowship and um, was also in, in the past um, Eisenhower um, uh, fellowship recipient. So here we go, Gregory. And uh, I made sure that Gregory leaves a lot of time for Q&A for you guys. OK, should I stand here or, it's, or I have my mic? OK. OK, hi, guys. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a presentation, but maybe it's something which is uh, not usual not to have a presentation uh, here. So I was mainly more focused on uh, telling stories about uh, things which are going on in human rights in Russia, but definitely we are covering the things which are going on currently in Georgia, South Ossetia, Northern Caucasus. So um, I would also like to tell you more about things which are going on there. Uh, so the major question we don't have answer on, uh, did we get a new president or we didn't? Uh, because uh, there were certain things we seen during Putin era about the limitations of human rights. Um, and um, I don't know to what extent you, you here are aware about things which are obvious for us. So that's why I just want to shortly uh, mention these kind of um, issues. So first of all, what was Putin for us, for people who are dealing with human rights in Russia? Putin for us was a guy who started war in the Caucasus. It was a war in Chechnya, which also included other part of the Northern Caucasus, Dagestan. So that was for us a kind of an entry point of, of Mr. Putin. He was also a guy who um, sent a message to business, arresting Khodorkovsky. He was also a guy who um, actually was at the time that a majority of Russian media uh, was bought by the state-related um, business like a Gazprom. Um, he was also a guy who organized a special law uh, to deal with us, non-governmental, non non-commercial organizations, and special agency to, to deal with us, you know, to let us report more, to let us tell more what we are doing, to what extent we have uh, foreign spies, as, as it is uh, something which is publicly announced. These guys are spies, you know, they are working for foreign embassies, they, they have their own interests, they serve the interests of a foreign, foreign countries. So, and then what happened? Um, then a new president came. We actually don't have elections, truly speaking, so we, we can't say if he was really elected. There is a big debate on is it possible to use the term election nowadays in Russia. After the hostage-taking operation, I'm sure you're aware of, in Northern Ossetia, in the school of Beslan, we actually also don't have elections on the regional level. So we currently have 86 regions in the whole Russia, and none of them are people who live there, citizens of Russia, elect the governors, elect the presidents. So it has nothing to do with federalism anymore, and probably with democracy as well. So um, what is it about the new president? He came up with a guy who kind of announced the liberal, liberal ideas. He was uh, mostly famous because he said he's reading internet, he's reading opposition websites, and we still have some of the news websites which have been organized by the businessmen who now live outside of Russia. Um, he was a guy who actually um, made a very interesting thing. Uh, we have this agency which deals with NGOs. So how to deal in the best way with um, Russian agencies, how to destroy anything. He announced the reform, the reform of agency which was uh, supposed to deal with NGOs and which was dealing with NGOs. So now we don't have it. He also, he, also, he also was probably very much involved in a trial we had against the leader of Internews, you know, the, uh, uh, the company which, uh, the non-governmental entity which also works on developing media. 
Uh, it was a trial against the leader, the director of this organization, uh, Manana Slamazian, who was really doing a lot in order to uh, develop media, to make it more independent, to make it more professional. And um, it was a trial against her. So one of the things uh, the new president made, he kind of was probably involved in the process, then this trial was actually stopped. We don't have uh, any more of this thing. But the most important thing happened just recently. He's clearly responsible for the new war in the Caucasus, which just happened now, um, because he's a guy who is in charge. Um, so we have now this new war in the Caucasus, and unfortunately, um, we need to you know, clearly see that there is maybe new president, maybe this is still the old president, but these guys which are um, um, running wars in our country. I want to tell you a little more about things which are going on there in the Caucasus, in the place where Georgia is, South Ossetia is, other parts of uh, uh, our Caucasus. So what's going on there in last years? There is absolutely no recognition that we have new power, new president in Moscow, because in the Caucasus things uh, does not really change too much. What are the major things going on there? Um, first of all, that's a very poor region. So there is a very bad social economical development there. So there are a lot of people who don't have jobs. The level of unemployment is like 60, in some regions 70, 75%. So people really don't have job. The level of corruption is enormously high. So it's not only about business, uh, it's also about people who uh, are working for state. Um, because the level of bribes is so high, so it's actually the question if we have corruption as a shadow type of economy. It's widely known in, in the Caucasus how much it costs to buy special position, either in government, either in ministry. So in case you want to have a good position, you can really buy it. I just want to tell you the interesting anecdote which recently was happening in the Dagestan, the part of the Northern Caucasus, where actually the local police was organizing meetings of protests because uh, they've been illegally uh, fired from their position. And the local police um, everywhere in Russia, uh, but especially in the Caucasus, are those guys who, who really use bribery a lot. So they actually paid for their positions to be on the certain, on the certain highways where the most of trucks are going on. Up to $20,000, that's kind of not the biggest fee. $20,000 you pay to, get, to, to be the local policeman on, on the road and to bribe all these guys who are passing through, for example, from Azerbaijan to, to Russia. Uh, and actually the meeting and the protest was not too much about the human rights, but about the deal. So we paid, you know, that was 20,000 bucks, you know. How you can actually dismiss us, you know? <laughs> What's the point? You know, we paid, that's our, that's our position. Uh, unfortunately, it's not always that funny in the, in the, in the Northern Caucasus because uh, through, through last years, um, we have a, a, a special uh, treatment, so-called. Uh, um, you, you use in the United States interrogation techniques. Uh, um, we call it tortures um, for people who are uh, religious dissidents. So those Muslims who live in the Northern Caucasus and who uh, are not part of the official um, kind of stream of um, uh, being Muslim, those people who are um, supporters of Salafi movement, uh, they unfortunately during last years have been tortured in many cases. A lot of international NGOs in the last couple of years start to um, covering this, Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, you can see in many other reports. Uh, recently, Crisis Group also filed the report about things which are going on there. Uh, and all of this was done because, unfortunately, in Russia there is a uh, law enforcement agency which really makes a, a type of uh, decision that those people who are religious dissidents were equal to terrorists. So we have our own war on terror, as you know. We are fully supportive to Mr. Bush and his ideas of war on terror, unfortunately. And in the regions of Russia, uh, we actually don't have too many terrorists. You know, we had a famous terrorist in Chechnya, Shamil Basayev, who was killed. Uh, and it's very hard to show where the real war on terror is going on. 
we don't have our own Iraq because the Chechnya for many years was already kind of very much closed for the journalists. The, the picture is kind of curtain is, is on Chechnya, so uh, showing the, uh, the nice images, the reconstruction is going on, the jobs uh, appears, so uh, it's impossible for, uh, for the state officials to tell about the Chechnya as a war on terror. So that's why, unfortunately, in the big parts of Northern Caucasus, we have this picture of fighting with the um, religious terrorism, which was not on place for a long period of time. But unfortunately, after years of uh, torturing and kidnapping people, uh, we really had um, uh, jihad announced in the Northern Caucasus. And that's now, it's becoming more and more uh, serious, a serious protest movement. Um, uh, because these people are started in last year to, to use terrorism, and the buses started to be um, uh, exploded, and uh, the explosion started to happen in other parts uh, um, of the Northern Caucasus. And that's kind of a very new delivery for Russia, because for years after the hostage-taking operations, then the terrorists killed uh, in the school with a strong involvement of the federal forces, who actually start to attack the school killed uh, uh, pupils of this school and, and some of their parents and teachers. After the, uh, this period, for a long time, the terrorism was not on place. But we are now talking about how state actually motivated those people who have been um, maybe radicals in, in, in religion, which is OK, to become extremists and to, uh, to take our arms. Uh, we have currently, for example, in the region of Ingushetia, which is neighboring to Chechnya, almost a war going on, where the attacks on the buildings, attacks and assassinations of the governmental officials are not happening a few times a month. They are happening a few times a week. And that's something we are trying to report about. Because in the official Russian media, it is only shown as a uh, war on terror. So there are people who are actually not armed. There are people who do not participate in something, who get killed. And after that, in the internet first, and in, uh, in uh, TV, and uh, in paper, and media, appears the information that another terrorist get killed. A lot of them get killed in their houses. A lot of them just get attacked while they are in their houses. So they are not actually participating in anything. Uh, a lot of them have been killed publicly. On, for example, on the market, then a whole crowd was in the market. And then the, uh, this law enforcement agencies, uh, the officers came, killed the person, uh, put a gun nearby to him and said, OK, here is a terrorist. Um, so unfortunately, uh, um, one of the issues is um, what I want to share with you is the issue of the uh, serious uh, uh, motivating by behavior state use now in the Northern Caucasus, those people who are in a protest to participate in an armed protest. We don't have, as you probably know, a strong opposition and um, civil and political rights everywhere in Russia. Um, but especially in the Northern Caucasus, um, uh, the one form of protest which is now available for people, which is public, is armed protest. And this is something which has nothing to do with Russia. It's not an internal agenda, because it has something to do with human rights. And that's why um, it is so important to deliver this, this information about things which are going on. Because it's not something which might go on for a longer uh, period of time. I just want to say uh, a few things about Southern Caucasus. We, we also work there. I don't know to what extent you are aware of um, uh, what happened in last years in the South, South Caucasus. We call the things which are going on in Russia authoritarian regime, because it's clearly a lack of uh, uh, civil and political freedoms. There is no opposition which is able uh, to compete for the power. Uh, the independent NGOs get pressed. But in the South Caucasus, it became even worse during last year. Unfortunately, the example of Russia is really important for people who are living in a 
former Soviet Union, as the United States is a very example for Russia, uh, taking into consideration Abu Ghraib, taking into consideration Guantanamo. Well, if United States can do this, in Russia it is widely spread techniques and there is no argument anymore uh, to deal um, with these kind of things. So for South Caucasus, unfortunately, in Azerbaijan, for example, there is a region, uh, oil-rich region, um, where there are political, free, uh, political prisoners for a long period of the time. There is no competition for the, uh, on, on any elections. Um, uh, there are also people who get uh, repressed uh, because of their um, religious uh, choice. Um, so it's really authoritarian state. And why I'm talking about this, because recently, uh, the same thing happened to the neighboring country, Armenia. Recently, um, it was elections going on. And it is a very interesting thing how, in some parts of the world, elections become a big deal. Then there is a big human rights violations, mass and cruel human rights violations. That's kind of the term. And in some regions, they totally have not been seen. In, as a result of these um, so-called elections in Armenia, um, where it was clearly they've been not free, not competitive. Ten people get killed from the uh, demonstrators uh, because dozens uh, of thousands went on the street to, to say that they don't believe in the results of the elections, uh, which were um, predicted from the very beginning. The prime minister clearly became a president. They actually made the same thing in Armenia uh, as, the, as it was done later in Russia. So the president became prime minister, prime minister became a president. So you see it's, a, it's this type of process going on in our part of the world and they just exchange their, exchange their kind of titles. They, okay, now on, the, on your cabinet would be my title, on my cabinet would be your title. So um, there is no serious reaction on that. It was a huge involvement in, in Ukraine. It was a serious involvement in Georgia. Uh, then uh, it was a lot of evidence that uh, the elections had not been correctly organized. But in Armenia, nothing happened. And that's uh, even more interesting because here in California, back in the Boston area, there are a lot of people, um, a lot of Armenians who live here. But uh, unfortunately, we, we haven't seen a really strong support Unfortunately, we haven't seen any strong discussion going on uh, about the elections, which unfortunately had nothing to do with the free and fair things. And international institutions actually played a very strange role, uh, announcing in the very beginning that it's more or less in the standards of Council of Europe. Later on, they made a little different statements, but uh, it is really interesting to see how all of this uh, does not influence the situation on the ground. Uh, and nowadays, in Armenia, political opposition uh, get into prisons. Uh, and that's clearly the choice of, of the people who live there. But uh, then there is so less of support coming from outside to deal with uh, these principles of, uh, of democracy. It's very hard for those people on the ground to do something. Um, I want to tell a um, few things also about the, um, about the so-called frozen conflicts. Uh, the Caucasus is widely known for so-called frozen conflicts. And what we are trying to do, we're trying to deliver the information from the region to really show that, unfortunately, in last years, we became really unfrozen. One of them is South Ossetia and Georgia. It's not that it happened in a couple of weeks from now. It's not that it happened a um, few days ago. Um, uh, it's really something which was going on for years. Then uh, people in South Ossetia, civilians, get bombed. Civilians, those people who are not participating in any kind of administration positions, those people who are not part of armed groups in, in South Ossetia. Um, we have a long list of, of uh, documents and facts uh, uh, showing that uh, that was not something which started uh, a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, the, um, after South Ossetia became de facto independent, um, it's actually part of Georgia, uh, uh, the Euro. Um, it was a lot of attempts to organize things which happened uh, this August. It was not the first thing, uh, first time happened thing. So um, we need to be clearly aware that uh, because of the intervention of, of Russian army, much more people get killed in Georgia 
because the Russian army started to, to bomb Georgian cities, and clearly the um, Russian army is not probably equipped that good to have this targeting bombing, or don't have such a point, actually, to, to target only, uh, only the military bases, although it was announced that they are targeting, targeting all, only military bases. But uh, the thing which is going on in, in South Ossetia is going on for a long time. And those people who are not mostly discussed on, on the public media, those people who are not mostly discussed uh, by politicians, uh, those people who live there, who live in the villages, that's a kind of a area high in the mountains, and who mostly don't have a very good job or don't have job at all, uh, who are like 40, 55,000 of them. It's not a huge population. Uh, and those people, um, they really have been forgotten in, in last years. So there is a strong debate now what Washington wants. You know, uh, Mr. Obama made a statement. Mr. McCain made a statement. Uh, there is a debate about whom uh, it is important to support. Clearly here, uh, much more discussion is about supporting uh, Georgia. And clearly, there is right on, on uh, territorial integrity uh, in Georgia as in any other country. But there is very less debate about those people who live there, who have been bombed, who, uh, who are in, on humanitarian catastrophe right now, who get killed in their houses, who never participate actually in any armed, uh, armed uh, operations, who are just civilians, and who really uh, were forgotten by the international community. Uh, there is no clear understanding that uh, those people in other parts of the Caucasus, for example, in Northern Caucasus, who has no rights, uh, the right of life is not something which is uh, very well uh, uh, shared uh, in the Northern Caucasus. Uh, it's not just their alarming words. Unfortunately, it is so that uh, as we, uh, we made us kind of our own statistics that law enforcement agencies in Russia changed their tactics from year 2007 to year 2008. Even year 2007, in the Northern Caucasus, there was enormous number of uh, people who just disappeared, so-called disappeared people. They've been arrested, then probably tortured, through tortures, probably killed, and then they disappeared. Their bodies never were found. Then, in year 2008, we have a statistics from the regions of the Northern Caucasus that people get mainly killed. So there is no any more uh, tactics to, to kidnap people. They most of all get killed in their houses on the streets. And yes, there are people who are participating in the terrorist groups. There are people who are participating in the armed rebel groups. But uh, these people also shouldn't be killed on the streets. Uh, in, case not, um, uh, in case they are not attacking, attacking anyone. So uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's the reality we live in. That's the reality when uh, civil political freedoms are not uh, really used. The right of life uh, uh, is something which, which is challenged uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And uh, that makes no, uh, no real uh, difference. What happens in Moscow if we got a new president? He was elected, maybe not, maybe yes. It makes no difference for people who live downstairs. I want in, uh, to tell a little in the end um, uh, about the things which are going on in the internet in Russia. Um, if, I don't know if it would be interesting for you or not. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the internet uh, as major media uh, became a battle of, uh, of fight between different groups um, who, who want to compete with each other um, through internet. So we have a very strong and um, very participatory uh, websites of terrorists and those who support terrorism. They really speak, uh, if you know Russian language, you would not understand. They really speak in a different language. Uh, it was announced jihad. Uh, in one part of Northern Caucasus and kabardino balkaria not in all parts of Northern Caucasus. And they speak from the understanding of, you know, using the religious terms so, so often, talking about this territory, using the terms of time, using a term of territory, just in a totally different way. So they're talking from, from the time uh, which, uh, which historically probably 
uh, uh, now goes on, but uh, not from the, from religious calendar. We're talking from li religious calendar, from religious ge geographical viewpoint, so it's not Russia for them. And uh, they're really uh, very actually effective in mobilizing people. Uh, these websites get used by huge number of uh, young people in the Northern Caucasus. Um, in opposition, fighting with them, there is Russian mass media, which is also delivering propaganda message in the same way that these guys, naming the Muslim people terrorists, even when there is no court decision. In majority of cases, there is no court decision at all because there is no court case. The person get killed, the law enforcement agencies announced that he was a terrorist, that's all, that happened. There's no investigation goes on, and even in cases that human rights NGOs are dealing with this specific person, and you know, sending, uh, sending letters to a prosecutor and requesting the case in, in majority of uh, the cases with no results. They're saying, okay, we don't have enough evidences, so on and so on, so there is no court decision on majority of people who are publicly announced as a terrorist. And Russian press just promotes this image. But it is not, unfortunately, only on this, on this level of um, a real fight between state and insurgents, terrorists, rebels. It is also, unfortunately, politically motivated. There is a serious fight going on. It's, it's even can call it an information war between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia in the internet, in mass media, in the statements of politicians. So you can really see how it is going on. So just, uh, it is not about delivering the information. It's about fighting with each other in the space of internet. Uh, it's not only, unfortunately, on the political level, but also on the ethnic level. One of the most popular, and actually the most popular, website in the Northern Caucasus is a website of a small nation uh, in Ingushetia. Ingush people are traditionally part of one ethnic groups with Chechens, but they have their own republic now, uh, and they have a strong fight for their mm, different president. They have a really motivated opposition, which is most, mostly outside of the region. So they have a very, very visited website where a lot of discussions uh, are going on. And it's also get quoted a lot outside of the region, but unfortunately, the reality is that um, there is ethnic fight between Ingush uh, representatives of Ingushetians and the neighboring region of Ossetia, which are actually uh, one nation with South Ossetia, which was uh, in the war right now with the Georgians. So uh, you will see in the website, unfortunately, a lot of hate speech. You will see in the website a lot, a lot of ethnic hatred information, which um, it's very hard, actually, to, to deal with this, because when a forum is open and then people participate in it, uh, I can understand the people who work for this um, website. Uh, it, it is very hard for them uh, to, uh, to clean up this information, although we, are, we can't be uh, very much sure that uh, that's a purpose they, they have, to clean up this information. So unfortunately, in, in Russian internet, a lot of these kind of tensions and fights um, are going on between political, religious, ethnic groups and when we're talking about uh, Northern Caucasus. And when we're talking about South Caucasus, taking into consideration example of um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So um, last things to say uh, is about the um, Russian internet in general. What happens with the Russian internet? As, as Russian media, it has a uh, strong involvement nowadays of the uh, of a big business, uh, which is state-controlled business. So companies uh, like Gazprom, uh, who uh, clearly implements a political will, uh, buying as much as they can buy, and other uh, and other related and um, in very strong connections with Russian official uh, um, companies are also buying a pieces of internet. We have a uh, you know that a lot was done in uh, creating a good image of a President Putin. So unfortunately, in in Russian, the most independent Russian uh, search engine, uh, a press conference of Putin was kind of a major event. It was a lot of uh, internet press conference of Putin. It was a lot of questions asked, there was a lot of attention raised, and on the conferences of the people who are dealing with research optimization, it is really strong debate now. If it is truly uh, uh, script organized, how news, uh, how news section of a big search engines uh, is collected, or there is some participation of the people. 
because sometimes you can see that the governmental sources of information really appears on the top, and human rights, non-governmental issues either don't appear at all, either you know, would appear later on. So it is a very big question. We, we don't have an answer on. Mr. Medvedev, the president of Russia, announced his uh, strong interest to internet, but would it lead to a cyber police, as we know, uh, experienced in uh, China and Vietnam, or would it lead to the uh, uh, freedoms uh, in the internet? We don't know an answer on this. We hope, uh, Lida just shared uh, to me that they have an uh, optimistic view on this. Um, Google works with Begun, Russian system now. We hope that's, that's one of the good signs for us. Uh, and we hope uh, international actors uh, would be uh, in Russian internet playing a uh, more and more important role, uh, introducing more and more uh, standards. Uh, um, but it is a very open question. So that was mainly the thing I was about to say. The last um, two sentences, what, what is really good to be done in Russia? I believe in Russia a lot uh, was done in order to influence the officials. A lot was done in order to, you know, to challenge the uh, presidents, to challenge the uh, different uh, um, people who work for the state. But um, that's not something which is really important. Uh, I really think in Russia the most important thing is to work with Russians, who those people who live uh, in the cities, in the villages, who those people who may be not strongly polit politicized, who, who those, those people who are uh, uh, not uh, taking a serious, uh, serious decisions every day, but uh, who uh, so far uh, support the, the regime we have. But those people who, in the surveys we, we are doing on, we worked a lot with the Washington-based uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, running the surveys in the regions of Russia, trying to find out how the people are thinking. Those who are don't care, those who don't really are uh, interested in human rights questions, those who are not really interested in, in democracy questions. I, I really strongly believe that um, for Russia, it's not a question of uh, uh, orange revolutions. That's not something which would work in Russia. For Russia, uh, the main question is a question of uh, changing people's attitude, influencing people's awareness, trying to uh, deliver the uh, idea of human rights the tools of using human rights to the people who are so far uh, not so interested in this. And that might be done through internet. That might be done in case the role and responsibility of the different uh, companies who are, are working in, in internet in Russia would be seen as uh, independent, as uh, caring about the human values, as about caring about the principles of equality, as uh, about things you are all uh, experiencing in your daily life, and we don't have chance to. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So you mentioned at the end that um, part of the reason that there maybe hasn't been a strong domestic opposition to Putin and Medvedev has been that it seems like a lot of people are not politicized. Is there any pros what do you think are the prospects for creating that kind of opposition? I mean, can it happen? Is it going to happen anytime soon, or is it just not possible until things change dramatically? Well, thank you. I was asked to repeat the questions because you don't have mice here. So you, you are, um, you are saying, is it possible the new opposition would appear in Russia? Um, well, certainly there are a, a number of leaders who, who would like to uh, to run the new opposition party. But I truly believe that it has nothing to do with the political leadership. It is not a question of a leader nowadays in Russia. It's a question of people who... Is that, is that, there is a chance that people themselves will get interested in, in case governing we, themselves. In, in case we leave it as it is, you know, there is a special fear of, uh, of ambassadors of Western countries in Moscow. They have a fear because of economical growth as they see, a huge palaces appears you know, on a monthly basis in a variety of uh, parts of Moscow. Uh, wealth, something which is represents 
represented really good nowadays. And there is a theory that economic wealth would bring democracy. I don't believe in it, truly speaking. And I don't believe that if we leave things as it is, and Russians would be more wealthy, and they would be experiencing the economical rights, uh, most of them would uh, develop themselves to the stage of uh, uh, experiencing the human rights, the values of democracy. I don't believe in this. Because you just need to go to Kazakhstan, because you just need to go to Saudi Arabia, because you just need to go to China, to many other places where development is not that much linked to democracy. And the idea that we just need to wait. You know, the Russia is a big guy, you have, they have oil and gas, we just need to wait. From time to time, they would develop their own opposition. They would develop uh, themselves in, into new democratic country. They would have an opposition. No, that would not happen. I don't believe in this. And uh, a very clear example for us is Azerbaijan, which is just nearby. Oil-rich country has a strong development uh, uh, for those people who are rich. Uh, very oil-related oil economy, but uh, unfortunately is not going to the level of uh, uh, democracy. Um, that's why uh, to the, it's not going to the level of democracy we would like to see in, in Azerbaijan. That's why um, I believe certainly there are chances. I don't believe there are countries for, for, for which, um, I don't believe that there are countries where a democracy can't appear which are not used to democracy. But a lot of things need to be done. Do you think your example always work? I mean, you talk about Saudi Arabia or basically about oil-rich countries where people kind of get wealthier, but because of this uh, single source of uh, wealth, oil, mm -hmm. where basically people work at uh, big oil companies and they all depend on essentially, essentially the government uh, with respect to their wealth. Uh, I wonder if there are any examples when uh, people kind of get wealthy because of their own business and stuff like that, when they really have to lose something that they earned, uh, that they created themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're so saying if this example exists in Russia, then people lose? Well, examples of countries where uh, economical growth was caused not by oil or other kind of natural whatever deposits, but by more like natural economic growth and where uh, that economic growth really led to uh, democratic, uh, to kind of increase whatever, to democratic changes. Yes, yeah, so I, I think I think the examples of countries where economic growth was really very good and they developed a good go governance is just the, the old Europe. Yeah, yeah, and we, we just look on, on the developments in Europe, how it was growing, growing, and growing, and we just look to the history of the United States as well. And we do see that there are examples uh, that these things got related. But it took centuries, first of all, um, um, and um, clearly some institutions were already, they already existed. That's what we don't have in Russia. First of all, I don't think we have centuries for, for development. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have institutions which might protect rule of law, which is so essential. Um, so then we're talking about the future, uh, which might happen. Unfortunately, it's, it's very hard to predict anything. But as you can imagine, when the majority of people don't care, and when authoritarian leaders just use their power, it's really hard to expect that any changes would appear. Um, and unfortunately, the examples of orange revolutions, which I don't think would adopt, uh, might be adopted for Russia, is also uh, a bit controversial. Because uh, I need to say this, um, um, because I know this, uh, the war which now is going on, and I hope it's going to finish, uh, between Russia and Georgia, um, actually, it, is, it was started by b bombardments which have been done, as I know, on my information, by Georgians, um, by the country which has a democratically elected president. Uh, well, they have a serious, serious problems in uh, two last elections. It was a lot of, unfortunately, unfair things done. But uh, in general, uh, we do see that uh, this type of revolutionary changes, which was used in, in Georgia, uh, 
at least in Georgia, uh, didn't lead to any great results. And that's another issue of, uh, of Ukraine um, as, uh, as other topic. Please. Uh, from a realistic point of view, um, what is your like, long-term forecast for the situation in like, uh, Russian part of Caucasus? Because it seems like Russia is like, slowly losing the, you know, the control in those areas, even though the military might still be there. And you know, things are going in a really bad direction. Like, the, if no major political changes happen, what do you think will, will be? If, there? What will happen? if no major political changes happen, you know, in Russia elsewhere, what do you think? Where, where do you think this is going? So where do you think the Northern Caucasus is going? Well, it's a very. Um, I would like to know this. Uh, uh, um, the things we we do observe right now. I, recently, I was traveling in, in in the region of Northern Caucasus just very extensively. Is that um, there is more and more um, dissent growing. Protest groups are becoming becoming more and more powerful. More and more people participating them, because there is so lack of political freedoms. You can't have a political party. You can't have an. You can hardly register the independent NGO. It's same as in Belarus. Well, in Belarus we have a law which actually uh, would send you to prison if you operate in, within an NGO which is not registered. We don't have such a law in Russia. But in reality, you would hardly register with an independent NGO. You would hardly open your own business without bribing seriously. Uh, the social lifts, lifts are really not working very well without bribing. So you would hardly get to the university, you would hardly get to a good school uh, without uh, bribing in direct or indirect form. This really uh, uh, moves people to the idea of a protest. And the, the major question uh, where we don't have an answer and probably we would not have an answer on, uh, would these people who are protesting now in the different parts of the Northern Caucasus be led by someone? Because there are social protests, pure social protests. The people just want to use their land they're living on. Because someone came from the local administration and said, OK, that's not your land. You can't have your cows here, which you have for centuries. Now this is a touristic area. You know, we take it from you. And the social protests start to grow. There are social protests then during winter time, on the Christmas, on the New Year, and during few weeks. Uh, while it is minus uh, 10 uh, outside, uh, the heatings are not working. Uh, there is no electricity. And the people are going on the streets. And the people are protesting. There are religious um, protests. Of those people, that's the smallest group, but uh, religious people who can't uh, just exercise their, their right to the uh, freedom of, of their religion. And these are also the protest groups. There are people who are fighting with the local corruption. Uh, and trying to get rid of a local uh, head of administration because it's, he is so corrupt it is, it is impossible to live in a village where are living. So there are all of these different groups which are right now uh, not recognized on the federal level. Russian federal authorities just gave rights to the local authorities to do whatever they want. Uh, they don't see that these kind of things are going on. Even in Chechnya, where we have this nice curtain showing that everything is very good, uh, even in Chechnya, even on official statistics, there are uh, uh, at least dozens of uh, young people who are living uh, to the forests and mountains uh, to support the rebels. They don't have terrorists there, they have rebels there. So even there, and unfortunately, unofficial statistics is very different. I don't want to say that um, Northern Caucasus has a chance to, to create a halifat. I don't want to say that Northern Caucasus has a chance to create an independent state. But the, um, the distance between uh, society and government, the level of polarization is growing. That's clearly what we see. Um, where it might bring us, I don't really know. It's really important to see how people are ready to participate in South Ossetia uh, uh, campaign. Uh, the number of people who are armed, who want to participate in uh, any kind of armed campaign is really substantial. So um, it's a very hard question um, about the forecast. It's a very hard question. We, we can't say anything for sure right now. Uh, also because of the participation in the Russian army in, in the, uh, South Ossetia. That's clearly made a difference. But uh, so far, we don't have 
any idea about the strategies which are implemented on the ground to deal with a real life of people, who deal with a, um, human rights violations, to deal with the social economical problems people have there. And growing polarization, unfortunately, already brought a terrorism for us as one of outcomes. It's clear outcomes of federal level not having proper strategies, of regional level not controlling the law enforcement agencies which are torturing people. The terrorism is already a result of this. This is not something brought from Iraq. This is not something brought from Afghanistan or Pakistan. This is a home growth problem which was organized by the people, not because of their will to organize terrorism, but because of the way they behave. So if I answer it, sure. In 1990, before the Soviet Union collapsed, what the ethnic mix in South Ossetia was? Uh, how much Ossetians, how much Georgians? In South Ossetia. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to repeat, as I was asked, uh, the, uh, the ethnic mix in South Ossetia before Soviet Union collapsed. Well, I believe um, the, the South Ossetian uh, territory is very complex. So uh, what is called South Ossetia has a special Georgian enclaves. So they have a, a number of villages which are uh, in majority populated by Georgians from both sides from side which is closer to Russia and from side which is closer to, um, to uh, Georgia. Um, so I believe um, uh, we can say that majority was um, Ossetians, although it would be very hard to measure because uh, no official statistics uh, is available. The unofficial statistics is a matter of propaganda. Uh, we know much better situation in Abkhazia, where majority were not Abkhaz people, but uh, um, Georgians and Armenians. But uh, much, uh, much, uh, much more less information from from South Ossetia. Um, in Abkhazia, it was ethnic cleanings uh, which were going on during the uh, military campaign. Uh, in South Ossetia, uh, it started, but it never went to that extent. So until now. It was very uh, different um, population, Georgian and Ossetian. If you look to the Georgian sources, they would give you a huge numbers of Georgians who live in South Ossetia. If you took to the South Ossetian sources, they would give you a huge numbers of, of South Ossetians who live there. Uh, I don't really think, uh, in reality, uh, uh, 80,000 people lived all together in the South Ossetia before this last campaign started. Uh, among them, I would say probably majority are Assetians. Thank you. Okay, Tilas, Lee, and you. Uh, if you were uh, talking to Barack Obama or John McCain today, advising them on how to deal with the new Russia under Medvedev, what would be your recommendation? What would you like to see America do mm -hmm. with regards to human rights in Russia, the situation in North Caucasus? Okay, you, you just saw what, what happened, you know, because I'm here on Stanford in this uh, Center for Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law, and that's exactly what I was doing, talking to the advisor of uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, maybe you know the specialist uh, uh, pro Professor Mark Fall, and then we had also a chance to talk to the people who work for, uh, for McCain. Um, I, I really believe uh, things uh, which are needed to be done. Uh, uh, the forces which are nowadays in South Ossetia should be replaced by uh, those uh, who would have international mandate. Probably it might be done in, in case some part of Russian forces would sign for a specific mandate of international peace, peacekeepers. It's clearly no one would send nowadays in the middle of electoral campaign in the United States uh, American soldiers for South Ossetia. But probably something might be done uh, to this extent to just change the mandate of the people who are there. So I, I would really think, unfortunately, we can't uh, nowadays um, really move force from the region because that's the information we have that the campaign was started not by Russia, but by Georgian. They start shooting and bombing. And, and that, unfortunately, gives no, uh, for the civilian population, gives uh, for them no chance to expect that that would not start it again. 
Um, so that's a major thing I would do. And I would say the same to, to any of them, and I did. So I'm glad uh, Obama made, <laughs> made some points in the end, uh, which are related to the idea of immediate negotiations and which are related to the idea of uh, 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 at least taking care of uh, those people who live there, civilians. Please. Uh, I just want to ask about the, when you're talking about the democracy of the Caucasus, you meet the Georgia, so you're talking about the North Caucasus and then go to the South, Azerbaijan and Armenia. How do you think the democracy is working on the Georgia? Because here on the mass media, we hear a lot like, Georgia is like the only democratic state in the North Caucasus. And from the other source, they hear like, uh, Georgian president has been elected with 95% of the votes. He used gas against opposition on the meetings last November, and things like that. So how would you talk about the situation? I mean, from what I heard, it looks like more, this is the same autocratic leader in the Georgia. He's just supported by the US. Mm -hmm. And so how would you comment on the situation with the democracy inside the Georgia? Democracy inside of Georgia. Long um, would be hard to answer. I was in the last, last elections of a president of uh, um, Georgia. I can tell you uh, that was a serious uh, violations uh, on these elections. I myself uh, seen things which we called. Uh, I don't know how to translate it into English, really. Uh, on, uh, then the buses with people are just moving from one voting uh, pool to one voting station to another voting station. So it clearly was serious human rights violations, but it is something non-comparable to the elections in Russia. In Russia, we simply didn't have elections. Then they had violations. Uh, it's not comparable to violations in Armenia. Violations in Armenia was also there recently, and the elections were much more hard than um, in Georgia. Um, I would say that um, mm, we have, by the way, in YouTube we published, I was there also in November, and you mentioned the, the gas against the position and the events of the 7th of November, then actually uh, uh, Saakashvili made a decision to attack the opposition, which was very peaceful. So uh, and it's very important to keep in mind that they also announced the state of emergency. Journalists were blocked to provide any information. So we went there and put to YouTube a few video interviews with those people who have not been allowed to talk. So clearly, uh, Georgia is much more democratic country than their neighbors, than Azerbaijan, than Armenia, probably than Russia. Um, although in last years, they clearly made a few steps, very serious steps, away from the uh, direction of democracy. Unfortunately, Mr. Saakashvili himself made a lot of serious decisions which has nothing to do with the choice of, of a person who respects human rights and democracy. One of them was the decision to bomb South Ossetia. It was him who said, after the military campaign in South Ossetia 2004, later on, uh, it was announced the Minister of Defense, Irakli Akrashvili, who is now in a position uh, to run the military campaign against South Ossetia back in the late, uh, summer 2004, um, which was almost the same to what we have now, uh, although they didn't invade um, uh, to the region. That was Saakashvili who announced that was my major mistake, Irakli Akrashvili and the campaign he organized uh, in South Ossetia. And now he just repeated that. Uh, unfortunately, clearly we have, um, he's not that authoritarian leader as, as Russian, as Azeri, as Central Asian ones, but we really have uh, nowadays uh, much more step away from the democracy in Georgia than we had two years ago. But there are people who vote for him he would not um, uh, won uh, in the same way he won, in, in case it would be real control of elections. But he really have a lot of people who vote for him. And really, developments of Georgia is very serious. One of them is a local corruption. If you talk to the people on the ground who really don't deal with any political issues, they would tell you that the local corruption is really something which is not practiced anymore to that extent and not even comparable to what we have in the Northern Caucasus. So the situation is very mixed. OK, it's, um, we are almost uh, in time. Uh, thank you for um, coming here. Uh, uh, I, 
I really hope you, you guys really look for um, different sources of information about things which are going on in, in the Caucasus because uh, sometimes when you talk to the people there, they really feel that they, no one is taking care uh, about things which are going on. They talk uh, in the same way that people from Central Asia talk to, um, to you when you're coming there. And it's really, uh, the whole globe don't care about civilians get killed, civilians get tortured, the people are just living there without any hope. Yep. So, so what are the good sources of information? Clearly, I'm coming from a source of information. <laughs> so I, I can clearly name us. Uh, uh, Caucasian Knot, we've been established uh, by Human Rights NGO International Memorial. So we try to be uh, not biased and uh, not to work for propaganda reasons. Um, um, you read Russian? Yeah, so um, uh, there are regional newspapers, for example, among them, one has a website. Uh, for many, uh, internet is not that available. In Dagestan, there is a newspaper, Chernavik, uh, for example. Um, it would be hard to name the good sources of information on, on Chechnya um, and on other parts of the Northern Caucasus, although um, we have editions in Russia, federal edition who writes very good about this. About South Caucasus, uh, I think the BBC Russian is a good source of information. The BBC Russian is doing actually a very good job, although they don't have a too big uh, internet presence. So if you have a chance to listen for the radio broadcasts, um, you would get much more information. But not too many, unfortunately. Uh, not too many. Okay, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.